Yeah. So uh, this is from uh, the slides from Cohort One itself. Um, I I have some additions, but um, I, I will talk about them later. So this is uh, the first chapter from the tools for creating effective models. Now, um, by this time, we have learned how to create models and uh, you know the basic workflow of tidy models. Uh, this chapter deals mostly with how to select the best models. I mean, one of the processes basically, not uh, you know the complete in itself. Um, so, so uh, these are the objectives. Uh, we would basically be dealing with these three ways of. Uh, you know, uh, getting the best model and all. So let's start with it. Um, so as you know, like, uh, you know, be, uh, when you start off with uh, any kind of uh, modeling, you set aside a training set and then a testing set. And the testing set should not really be used for uh, evaluating the models. They should only be used for, you know, at the end, uh, getting the performance, how good a model is on the test set. So for evaluating the models, what you can do is that uh, you can create, uh, you know, subsets out of the training set itself. Uh, so this is one example of the flowchart. Like you, you have your training set, and then uh, you evaluate the model performance. Some models require a hyperparameter tuning, so those things also go in here. Like uh, you know, you tune the model and then uh, rerun it on the training set. Uh, by setting aside uh, a certain fraction of the training set for the uh, you know evaluation. Uh, so, um, so like okay, I mean this is how the tidy models is done. Uh, one example here that's uh, shown here is uh, for example if we were to train uh, like using the AIMS data set itself, if we were to train that uh, random forest model. As well as a you know a linear regression, and then you ran the models on the on the data set itself, the training data set itself. You will see that uh, you know the LM model is not as good as uh, the random forest. It's it's kind of expected. You know the RMSE is uh, higher than uh, the random forest. The R square is uh, lower than the random forest. But uh, when you you know run the same model on the test set, what you get is that um, you know the random forest it does uh, worse than the linear model did on the training set itself. Uh, the reason is simply that uh, you know this model just uh, you know kind of overfitted on the training set, so it was providing a you know a better uh, estimate of the uh, performance. Uh, but when you test it on the test set, it you know it does much worse than the training set. So it's not able to generalize very well on the new data set. So uh, you know uh, we have already seen the data uh, the test set here. So the ideal way is to um, use some kind of free sampling method. Uh, so you know you have your data you separate into training and test sets. And then within the training set, you create different resamples of the same data set. And within each resample, you have a analyze and a evaluation set as it's, uh, you know, uh, this is a tidy models uh, nomenclature. Like you have your analyze split and your uh, uh, evaluation. Uh, for, for example, if you wanted to, okay, it's not shown here, but uh, Basically, what it does is that you know you have your 80-20 split, for example. Like you, uh, let's let's walk out walk uh, with a simple cross validation, for example. Uh, so v full cross validation, uh, cross validation, validation. Sorry. So uh, let's say it's a threefold iteration. So what it does is that uh, let's say there are 30 data points. It will separate it into you know a random subsample of uh, three. Like you have this three different colors. So two of them are kept in the, you know, the first iteration and the, the one set of this, this color is uh, set to the eva um, evaluation set. You know, the two of the colors are in the analyze set and the, one of them is in the eval set. So that's, uh, that's one iteration. Then the same with the second one, but this time the, you know, a different set is chosen for evaluation. And the third time a different set is chosen for evaluation. 
So, you know, the final metrics, whatever you're computing, you know, it could be RMSE also. So the final, final metrics would be an average of these, uh, the, the performance of the model on these three uh, test sets or evaluation set as they are called. Uh, so it, it kind of gives you a better performance estimate because you are averaging the, you know, the model predictions over three different uh, uh, evaluation sets. So uh, you can be a little more certain about, uh, you know, the model's uh, RMSC value or uh, if, if it's a um, classification model then accuracy or other, you know, metrics. Uh, so this is a simple V-fold cross-validation. Uh, cross validate, cross uh, the way to do it is uh, you know, use this V-fold CV. So it automatically splits uh, the AIMS train set into 10. Uh, you know, it creates a list column and has all these uh, uh, data sets in it. Uh, the uh, one thing to note is that uh, it doesn't really hold a data set, but it just creates the splits. So that way it's more efficient than actually, you know, partitioning the data and storing them here. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so it's mentioned as an analysis and assessment set. Uh, in case you are using a, you know, uh, like a, the analysis set would be the one on, uh, which you actually fit the model and the assessment would be the, the one which has been held out for uh, you know valid, uh, validation. Like these three would be the uh, assessments and these three would be the analysis sets. So this is the simple V-fold cross-validation. Cross uh, then you have the repeated cross-validation. Uh, it uh, has the same function, but instead uh, you pass an additional parameter called repeats. Uh, basically what it does is that it uh, carries out the same tenfold cross-validation, but uh, repeats it five times. Uh, the advantage that you get here is that uh, since it's, uh, you know, uh, now you're averaging it over uh, V cross R number of uh, sets basically, right? So your estimates are even more precise here. Um, uh, so like uh, it's not mentioned here, but uh, what it does is that uh, like, let's say Sigma was your uh, uh, standard deviation on the, uh, the RMSC value for any linear regression that you fitted. Uh, if you do a, tenfold uh, cross validation with five repeats. So you total, uh, you know, uh, that sigma, the new sigma would be uh, the original standard deviation sigma divided by uh, the root of uh, 10 cross five, basically. So it uh, helps in uh, minimizing the, <coughs> excuse me, it helps in minimizing the standard deviation. Um, yeah, I mean, the standard errors are reduced basically. Uh, reducing the standard, like, so So it depends on uh, what kind of data set you have. Like if your performance metric isn't really good on the, you know, if you run a simple 10 full CV and you're getting a very high standard deviation of the performance metric, like RMSC or something, uh, then it would be a good option to use a V full CV with uh, repeats. So, so, so as to further lower the, uh, the, the standard error of uh, the, performance metrics that we are computing. It need not necessarily be that we should do it always, but uh, again, like depending on uh, uh, the, the performance on the, the v, uh, without repeats, it might be a better choice to go with this. Um, any questions here? All good, okay. Um, so leave one out estimates. Uh, this is basically like if you have uh, very small data sets as in, you know, you have in statistics most of the times. Uh, so what you do is that, uh, let's say you have a hundred data sets, a hundred data points. Uh, you train the model on 99 and then estimate its performance on that one that you didn't train it on. And you simply, you know, you do it for all the, do it hundred times basically so that, uh, uh, your final estimate is based on 100 individual data points, but uh, it can be very noisy and uh, it, uh, 
like for medium size data sets this doesn't uh, really hold good like in medium or big size data set leave one out estimates are simply not feasible because you know, you can't really retrain those many models um and then you have uh, uh, monte carlo cross validation uh so this is very similar to vfold cv but uh, you know uh, the the one difference is uh, that uh, the resampling generated are not mutually exclusive as the same data points can appear in the assessment set multiple times. Um, so this is the way to do it. Um, you know, it's very similar to the output that's generated by those vfold CV. Uh, then is this concept of validation sets uh, where you're, where, you know, when you have really big data sets, you, you cannot really do you know, uh, 10 for um, uh, Sorry, my, sorry, sorry. my, uh, the voice is echoing. Um, okay, yeah, that's better. So, yeah, um, so you have your data set, uh, you basically put out a, uh, you, you separate it into three parts, the training, validation, and testing sets. Uh, validation would be simply a set of data where you, you know, compute the metrics basically for the each of the models that you have trained. Uh, it's, it's just a, a single set of data and uh, you won't necessarily be training multiple models and evaluating on multiple data sets, but uh, that's a limitation uh, if you have uh, big data sets, like if you have billions of rows, you cannot really mul train multiple models, uh, train uh, different iterations of the same model again and again. So that's where validation sets come into picture. It's also used for hyperparameter tuning. Like you have number of trees or those kind of metrics. So, you know, you, you kind of, uh, you know, once you have finalized the model, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, actually tune the number of trees parameter, for example, in random forest by looking at the validation set, how it's behaving, uh, you know, are, are you getting a better estimate by changing the number of trees, for example? And then that's the number of uh, trees you will be selecting uh, as a hyperparameter for that kind of forest. Um, so yeah, it, it's used, uh, you can call it by using this validation split, passes a proportion parameter, which is you know 0.75 here. So, it will separate uh, the training set as 0.75 and the remaining as the validation set. Uh, bootstrapping is another method here. Uh, so it does uh, resampling, uh, uh, but uh, you know, without uh, like it can have repeats basically. Like uh, and and the size is the same as the original training set. For example, if you started off with 30 data points. Uh, the bootstrap iteration one would be having a, a training or a analysis set of uh, 30 data points, but uh, they would be taken, uh, you know, with replacement. So same data points can appear multiple times. And the ones which did not really appear in the training set or uh, analysis set, they will be put in the assessment set here. So the one thing is that the assessment set size can vary but it generally provides much better estimates, uh, you know, compared to others. Um, so this is for bootstrap. If you want to, you can use this, you know, times parameter here for getting the bootstrap uh, data sets. Uh, the values of course would be different here. And then for time series, uh, so the thing about time series is that you know it's uh, direction dependent. So uh, you cannot really do random resamplings of the data set because uh, you know the the any value for the current uh, let's say time t would be dependent on t minus one. So uh, the the only way to do it is. Uh, I mean, one of the way to do it is using uh, this rolling um, rolling forecast uh, uh, resampling. It's called rolling origin. So what you do is that, uh, let's say you take the first eight uh, data points, train the model on this, and then predict on 
uh, the data points 9, 10, 11. Uh, same with your example two, where you start off with the second data point and go to nine and then uh, evaluate the metrics on the next three data points. And, you know, similarly, uh, you know, you can do, like, for example, this is for five. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you can similarly extend it to others. Uh, there's another way of evaluating the performance where, uh, you know, uh, you basically don't drop this assessment uh, set value. For example, you know, consider this, this uh, row here. So you, you train the model on five to 12 data points and evaluate it on 13 to 15. Uh, next time you train it on four to 11, but evaluate on uh, you know 12 to 15. So it will be having one extra data point here. Similarly, when you are training it from three to 10, you'll be evaluating on 11 to 15. So that way your uh, uh, performance metrics, uh, the data set on your uh, assessment set will be having more, po uh, more data points. So it will give you better estimates. Um, and uh, that's for uh, the time series. Uh, I know that uh, uh, this model time has, uh, you know, it, like one of them, I mean, it, it's, it's, I feel that it's kind of being developed a uh, little separately from the tidy models interface. Uh, but again, like we can chat about it in other, uh, maybe in the chat or later on. Um, so these are the methods of estimating uh, your model performance. Uh, um, so, um, so how would you actually estimate the performance here? So uh, you, you create a workflow with your uh, recipes and uh, uh, the model, whatever you chose, and then use this fit tree samples. So if you don't have any samples, you just use the fit method and it does everything. But uh, when you do have a, a performance metrics to compute, you use the fit resamples. Uh, I pass on the resamples, uh, you know, whatever you use, like refold CV or bootstrap or whatever. And the control is basically if you want to keep the predictions or not. Like if you don't, like generally we are not really interested in predictions here, but we are more interested in the metrics that were computed. So by default, it doesn't really keep the predictions, but if you want for, uh, you know, like if you want to really have the predictions, then you can pass this parameter here. Um, any questions? Okay. Um, so one thing about uh, uh, you know recomputing the same model on different data sets is that uh, you know these are all independent and they can be easily parallelized. Parallelized, sorry. Uh, so uh, so for example, the, the for each package, if you just load it and uh, you know call the library on that, then. Uh, all this uh, fit tree samples and everything, it will be using the parallel backends. So this would be much faster. Again, like uh, uh, like there's this line that's mentioned here that uh, you know it's it's not a linear uh, improvement in the performance, but uh, uh, you know because there's some overhead that's spent in distributing the data sets across the cores for computing it. So. It's not a linear uh, improvement, but it's definitely better if to use a, for, uh, you know, a parallel backend if you have uh, multiple cores and uh, a big data set, basically. Um, and then you have uh, you know, saving the resampled objects. Like uh, if you use that keep threads uh, thing, uh, so you can specify the keep thread. Um, the controls and uh, uh, it will save the predictions. But uh, again, like uh, unless you need it, there's no point of uh, having the predictions on your uh, uh, like cross validation sets. It, you're only interested in the metrics here. Once you have the best uh, model selection, then you can refit it on the whole training set and get the 
the model there and then maybe the predictions on validation sets um so yeah i mean that's uh, that's this uh, chapter in just uh questions and discussions does anyone have a go to <laughs> uh, kind of method that they use for resampling because for, for me whenever i've done it it's always been bootstrapping or cross fault validation but I find bootstrapping easier to comprehend, so it's often end up using that. It's not not a great reason for choosing the method. I uh, per personally tend to use, um, but if it's non if it's non time series data, I tend to use uh, Monte Carlo uh, rather than um, rather than the standard method. Um, I don't know why it's just a go to in my mind. Um, and then for the, even if it is time series, you can technically still use um, a normal cross validation if the errors are uncorrelated. Um, I think Hyman has a paper on that. Um, but other than that, is you typically go to your tenfold cross validation. So that's that's the order in which I tend to go things. Well, time series isn't it? like a condition that the errors would be uh, correlated. Like that's the whole point of a time series, right? I don't know, maybe I'm missing something here. Like time series is not really my forte, so pardon me. It's, it's not always the case that you have um, uh, uncorrelated errors, uh, that you have co uncorrelated errors. It, it depends on the time series. Like it's not necessarily particularly common, um, but you can, you can turn a lot of uh, models into white noise models if you want to. Yeah, okay. Yeah, if it's white noise, then it makes sense, of course. Um, it, I've just found a paper, sorry, uh, that Hyman talks about it. Oh, okay. Thanks. I was also going through. Yep. Um, can you see my screen? It's a. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So this has a really good discussion on when to use uh, which kind of cross validation technique. Uh, basically, um, Max talks about. Uh, uh, this uh, you know classic diagram of precision versus accuracy. Um, so let's say you have your uh, you know you use a fifty percent of your data set for your two fold CV like you know have your, your you have your fifty percent on your analysis set and fifty percent of the data on your assessment set. So you have a lot of data on your assessment set, but uh, the model doesn't have much data to train on. So while the outputs on you know the metrics computed on the assessment sets uh, they would be very similar okay but uh, they would be they would need, need not be necessarily accurate like you know you'll have something like uh, this scenario where uh, the assessment sets are uh, uh, providing generating the similar output but uh, they are not necessarily accurate so you, you have high precision but less accuracy there um, similarly, when you have, uh, you know, a uh, lot many uh, uh, cross-fold validations, so for example, 10-fold, uh, so you, you have uh, enough data for the model to train on, um, so, you know, it will be tending more closer to your, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, accuracy and precision as well. Um, so he has done simulations on uh, 1,000 uh, trees in the random forest model. Uh, he talks about uh, uh, variance and bias change in CV and also whether it's worth repeating cross validation. And uh, these are the outputs that he generated. Like uh, he is using the, he basically generated a data set uh, so that his, uh, you know, the parameters are known. So you have your, uh, RMSC variance here, and then the number of held out data sets. So when the number of held out data sets is uh, 
uh, small, like for example, five-fold CV, uh, we have a much higher variance. That is the, you know, the outputs, uh, the metrics computed on the answer sets, and those are very different across the five folds that we have. Similarly, when you have more number of, uh, uh, as the number of held out sets uh, kind of increases, your medium variance goes down. Like for example, tenfold would be having a much better, uh, much lower uh, median variance compared to five fold. And uh, similarly, these are all tenfold repeated CVs. So, you know, this is tenfold, 10 times repeated. So you have 100 here. So, yeah. This That's really thing. interesting. Thanks. The, I guess there's a, yeah, the other side of it is the like computing power and whatever, and whether prepared to being involved with parallel processing. Stuff like that. But it's interesting that it continually goes down in all those, all those examples. Yeah, yeah. So the variance definitely goes down as you increase the number of folds in your CVs or uh, increase the repeats, uh, which is kind of expected. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, that's there. Similarly, with bias, it, it kind of drops significantly when you are using the you know, ten-fold CV itself compared to five-fold. Uh, so, yeah, it's there. He also talks about others like uh, leave group out estimates. But it's, um, I, like, I'll have to dig deeper into this, like uh, what this group actually means. So I think it's a modification of that leave one out estimate that instead of leaving one out, you are leaving out a group, but then how is it different from uh, this? Fold, valid, fold validation. I'm not really clear on this unless someone has something to add. Is it the case that he's leaving out um, one factor level? Yeah, that could be the case here. But yeah, like I, I'll need to go to the data set itself for this. It's not really available. He talks about it here but uh, he hasn't really specified what are the groups here or uh, you know, factors if they exist or not. So it could be that uh, you know, the groups are actually factors here, but it's a little not, not that clear though. Yeah, he talks about a lot of stuff here. So yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Can you share that link in the chat room? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks. So, yeah, I mean, if anyone has questions, Not me. That's great. Thank you. Okay. You. Yeah. Okay. Thank. Thanks, everyone. All right. Yeah, Cheers. See you. See you next week. See you next week. Yep. Bye. All the best.